Hello, and welcome to bird watching. This is part four of a four part program about ruby throated hummingbirds. And we're here to talk about attracting hummers to your yard. I am your host and fellow bird watcher, Sharon Sorensen. We've talked about the basic characteristics of hummingbirds, their migration and nesting habits, the threats and predators that they face, and given all that, assuming their survival, how can we attract them to our yards? Most wannabe hummingbird hosts begin by putting out a nectar feeder or two, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But before you do, you have to recognize that feeding hummingbirds is a full season commitment. And if you know you can't make the commitment, then don't put out the feeders. Don't allow nesting female hummingbirds to become dependent on your feeders only to abandon them mid-season. So here's what's involved in the commitment. You need to mix your own syrup, four parts water, one part cane sugar, boil it and cool it. And yes, I know you can purchase ready mixed syrup, but most of it has red dye. And for the sake of the bird's reproductive success and their kidney health, we really know we need to avoid red dye. So yes, put red on the feeders, but not in the feeders. We also need to keep that syrup fresh, meaning that we resupply it every three days. If they haven't drunk it all in three days, you pour it out and put in fresh. And you must keep those feeders sparkling clean, scrubbing it with each refill. Now that kind of commitment can get old if it starts the 1st of April and ends the 1st of October or so. So be sure you're prepared and know what you're getting into before you start. But let's assume you are prepared. You are ready to make the commitment and oh my what a pleasure you're in for to have these hummingbirds in your yard. So let's choose the right feeder. I like a good feeder that's durable and for that I choose glass feeders. That's just a personal preference of mine. I like them because they're readily, uh, they can be filled readily. They have a wide mouth for filling. I like a feeder with perches, although certainly that isn't important, but it gives me a good time to view the birds as they feed. I also choose feeders with lots of red on them because remember we put red on the feeders, not in the feeders. And I want feeders that are easy to clean and notice how this one comes entirely apart. And sure, there are many others that are equally good. I just happen to be using this one for an illustration. You also need to choose the right size for the number of birds you have. Now this feeder holds a quart. And remember that we fill this, uh, refresh this every three days. So if your birds aren't going to empty a quart feeder in three days, don't choose a quart feeder. Or at least don't fill it full, you'll be wasting a lot of nectar. You will want something with bee guards and you will want an ant guard. And most feeders nowadays have an ant guard built in. And you'll see that all you have to do is put some water in it, and that prevents the ants from crawling down the sides and getting into your feeder. There are some no-nos. They should be obvious. But you must never, ever use honey, molasses, raw sugar, brown sugar, artificial sweeteners, or actually anything other than plain white sugar, and preferably cane sugar, because cane sugar is closest to the pure nectar, much closer than beet sugar. So where should you put these feeders? Well, obviously where you can see them, you want to enjoy these wonderful creatures, and you'll want it out of the sun, because sun does cause the nectar to sour more quickly. You want it out of the reach of predators for the safety of your birds, and you want it near nectar-producing flowers simply to attract the birds to it more quickly. And when should you hang them? Well, depending on where you live. If you live on the Gulf Coast, you want to put them out the last week of February. But for those of us through the Midwest, April 1st or even tax day is a good time. And keep them out through late December 
This picture taken on December the 6th in southern Indiana shows why. And the last birds through are the ones most in need of our feeders. So let's say you've done everything right. You have all the good feeders. You have all the right nectar. You're taking care of it. You're being very careful with your, your care of your feeders. And lo and behold, you still don't have hummingbirds. And why would that be? Well, remember their diet is 40% nectar for energy and 60% small flying insects for protein. So as Robert Sargent said in his book, Ruby-Throated Hummingbirds, hummingbirds are best considered high speed, high energy, bug eating machines. So bugs are pretty important. It's not all, it's, it's not just about feeders and feed, you see. For birds, it's always about habitat. And what do we mean by habitat? It's food, shelter, nesting, and water. Well, let's start with food. We've already talked about those feeders, of course. But given that it's 40% nectar and 60% bugs, here's the thought. That while hummingbirds readily come to feeders, it's the habitat that attracts them. Plants catch their attention first. Sherry Williamson, who is the author of the Peterson Guide to Hummingbirds of North America, said in the introduction to that book that we can best attract hummingbirds by providing, quote, a naturalistic landscape with a variety of cover, unlike the typical suburban yard with its vast expanse of lawn, which is a virtual wasteland. She uh, parallels uh, Robert Sargent's, Sargent's comments when he says, individuals remember the exact location of flower gardens and hummingbird feeders from the previous year. So some suggestions that you might consider, uh, native trumpet honeysuckle, sweet bay magnolia, joe pie weed, native hyssop, native jewelweed, native monarda, in this case it's a cultivar, Native sage cultivar come in many different, they come in many different colors, even garden plants like runner beans. And then, my goodness, an array of things of all colors, cardinal flowers, royal catchfly, coral bells, America wisteria, bee balm, columbine, liatris, cross vine, jasmine, Indian pinks, and yes, I even have lantana in pots. So, you see, it isn't just a red plant. It's a plant that has a lot of nectar. And since these birds move from the far reaches across the United States, north and south, and all the way into Central America, they're accustomed to nectaring at a lot of different kind of plants. So what they want are plants with nectar for which there isn't a great deal of competition from bees. Bees are attracted to plants because of the aroma, and hummingbirds would just as soon avoid bees, so they tend to avoid plants with a strong aroma. So again, that diet, 40% nectar, 60% flying insects, as Williamson would say, insects that would not be welcome in a traditional garden, such as aphids, gnats, and fruit flies, are vital resources get that, vital resources in the hummingbird-friendly landscape. So if hummingbirds can't find 60% of their necessary food supply in your yard, then, well, they won't be in your yard. Native plants support native bugs that feed our native birds. So that's sort of a mantra that I use to plant in my own yard. And if you missed it, there is a YouTube video on this bird watching channel called Birds and Native Plants the Essential Connection. You might be interested in checking that out if you haven't already. But the bottom line is you must never, ever, ever use pesticides if you want hummingbirds in your yard. Pesticides are never insect specific and to spray them means that you kill whatever insects come around.
no bugs, no birds, no hummingbirds. So we've taken a look at food. Let's consider shelter. Now they're tiny little birds, so shelter would seem to be fairly minuscule, and indeed it is. A single leaf can protect a bird. However, they do like a lot of vegetation, and you will find far more birds in an area that is somewhat wooded or at least densely planted than you will find hummingbirds in, say, that open landscape of vast mowed lawns that Sherry Williamson talked about. So what about nesting then? Well, as you might guess, it's very similar. They nest in most any kind of tree or shrub or even vine. They're not particular about the species of vegetation, but they do want a lot of vegetation and they tend to nest in wooded areas and they tend to nest in wooded areas with water either in or nearby. So speaking of water, what about water for the birds themselves? Well, they love to bathe in the rain, as this one is doing. But you know, you don't always get rain when you'd like to take a bath. And so, yes, they come to water in your yard, including this bubble rock. And you will see, yep, right there it is, almost hidden in this big rock. But in that shallow water, it finds the perfect place to take a bath and get a drink. So... If you're providing food, shelter, nesting sites and materials, and water for your hummingbirds, you're doing the very best service you can to these remarkable, delightful birds. And I trust that you will have lots of hummingbirds in your yard. Thank you for joining me for this section of birdwatching ruby-throated hummingbirds. If you have other interests in birds, be sure to check out one of or more of my other three books. Um, they're available from your friendly local bookseller or from your favorite online source. Or visit my website, birdsintheyard.com, or join me on Facebook. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoy the birds, and may you always have birds in your binoculars.